Hey guys, welcome back. So t this video, we will talk more about the absolutism throughout the rest of Europe. So we'll start in France, and this is under the rule of Louis XIV. So in order to create more stability, many countries started increasing the power of the monarch, which is called absolutism, which basically means that the ruler will hold all of the power. So this ties closely to divine right, where they would claim God gave them the power to control everyone and everything. So Francis Louis XIV Louis is the greatest example of absolutism throughout 17th century Europe. So in the 50 years before Louis XIV, France was struggling to avoid a breakdown of the state. So his, I'm assuming father, Louis XIII, and then him, Louis XIV, were very young when they took the throne and had uh, help from royal ministers. So with Louis XIII, you had Cardinal Richelieu, and with Louis XIV, you had Cardinal Mazarin. So Richelieu strengthened the monarchy by stripping political and military rights from the Huguenots and strengthened central power under the monarch. And he would also set up spy networks in order to, in order to uncover and crush conspiracies, mainly against the king. So Cardinal Mazarin is going to die when Louis XIV is 23, which is going to prompt Louis to take control, uh, total control of France. So the royal court that Louis sets up in Versailles has three main purposes. First, the royal council uh, was the personal household of the king, so they would stay at Versailles with the king. These chief offices of the state were located in Versailles, and Versailles was the place uh, was a place powerful subjects came to find favors and offices for themselves. So if you wanted to make your name in politics in France, you would try and get in at Versailles because that's where everything happened. So Louis's greatest threats were his highest nobles who wanted to, uh, to play a role in government. So Louis is going to remove them from court, and then Louis's government ministers were there to obey his every wish. So they did everything that Louis wanted. He had complete authority over foreign policy, the church, and taxes. And he would also bribe local nobles to carry out whatever policies he wanted at local levels. Uh, to create religious order, he would order all Huguenots to convert to, Christi uh, to Catholicism, and then destroyed their churches, and then would close their schools. Over 200,000 Huguenots would flee, uh, flee to England, uh, the United Provinces, and German states. So Louis's lifestyle and wars needed money, and his finance guy was Jean-Baptiste Colbert. So Colbert went with the mercantilism approach of sending out more exports than they would receive in imports, meaning you're sending out, you're selling more stuff than you're buying, so you're making money that way. Colbert would have roads and canals built in order to move goods throughout France much easier and cheaper. And then Louis developed a standing army of 400,000 and would wage four wars between 1667 and 1713. During those wars, he did add some territory and was even able to add his own dynasty member to the Spanish throne. So one of his, I believe it's one of his children, was basically married off to the Spanish uh, monarch. So Louis XIV will die in 1715, and he's going to believe that he didn't do a very good job as king. And he told his great-grandson and his successor, although he was like two or three, he was an infant at the time, but he says to him, you are about to become a great king. Do not imitate me either in my taste for building or in my love for war. Live in peace with the nations. Strive to relieve the burdens of your people in which I have been so unfortunate as to fail. So he didn't believe he did a very good job as king, and he wanted his successor and his grandson to do a, his great grandson to do a better job than he did. So absolutism in Spain will fail, but in Eastern and Central Europe it was much more successful. So after the Thirty Years' War, two major Central European powers are going to rise, and that's Prussia and Austria. 
So outsiders view Spain as Europe's largest power in the 17th century, and it's the closest to absolutism when Philip IV was in power. So he was trying to centralize the government into the hands of the monarchy, but he couldn't control power of the nobles and had too many expensive military campaigns leading to more revolts in Spain. So in Prussia, you have Frederick William the Great Elector, and he's going to help Prussia emerge as a powerful German state. So with no natural frontiers for defense, he's going to build the fourth largest army of over 40,000 men in Europe. And he will create the General War Com Commissariat. And they're going to basically levy taxes and oversee the army's growth. So the Commissariat became the civil government with many of their officials um, being part of the Junkers, and the Junkers were their landed aristocracy, so they're rich people basically, who served as army officers. Uh, Frederick William's son will become king in 1701, known as King Frederick I. So in Austria, you have the Habsburgs, and they're going to play a very significant role in the Holy Roman Empire. So after that 30 years war, they will create a new empire in Eastern Europe. Uh, the Austrian Empire will encompass modern Austria, the Czech Republic, and Hungary. Uh, after defeating the Turks at Vienna in 1683, they'll take control of Transylvania, Croatia, and, Slo and Slova Slavonia. So the Austrian Empire never became a highly centralized state. There was just too many different nationalities and too many ethnic groups that would make that possible. But they were a collection of territories united by that Habsburg dynasty. So in Russia, their state is going to start emerging in the 15th century. In the 16th century, Ivan IV becomes the first czar, which is just what Russia calls their leaders. He's known as Ivan the Terrible because he was very ruthless. He even actually stabbed his own son while having an argument with him. In 1598, he'll die, leading to a time of anarchy known as the Time of Troubles. So that's going to end when the National Assembly will choose Michael Romanov as Tsar in 1613, and the Romanov dynasty will rule until basically the end of World War I in 1917 and end with the Bolshevik Revolution. So the most prominent and famous czar during that era was Peter the Great from 1689 to 1725. He was absolute leader and believed in divine right of king. And he would visit the West and wants Russia to modernize. By that, he, I mean, he basically visited the uh, Western Europe, like France and Spain and England. And he wants Russia to kind of do what they're doing and modernize. So he built... Uh, the army and navy by drafting peasants into a 25-year enlistment and would raise military numbers to 210,000. And then he began to introduce Western cus uh, customs into Russia. So Peter wants to open a door to the West, needs a port on the Baltic Sea to do so. So he's going to fight a war with Sweden. They will win and they will build what's known as St. Petersburg in 1703 which was the major port and capital of Russia until 1918. So Peter's going to divide Russia into provinces and will try to impose a military state. So he wants his administrators to be slaves and free people at the same time, which doesn't really work well. What I mean slaves is basically he wants them to work for him for really no compensation, but he wants them to feel like they're free to do whatever they want, which is very conflicting. And with that, I'll end this video, and in the next one, we'll finish this chapter off by talking about European culture after the Renaissance. See you guys. Thanks.